And yeah, um, uh, you can put your questions in the uh, Q&A tool and we're gonna uh, get to those at the end. Okay, I'm ready when you are, I can share my screen. All right. Um, okay, I will, let me get the screen sharing up. It is nice to see everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your series. Um, I'm happy to know that people are interested in this um, work on class theory that I'm doing. So let me um, pull up a presentation here. All right. So um, I wrote a, a paper recently um, called Why Does Class Matter? And there are some obvious reasons why class matters, and I think some less obvious reasons. But um, I'll just say something about why I felt the need to write this paper to begin with. Um, if you are an economics student, it might be somewhat obvious that class is an important um, causal variable. You might think about it in terms of inequality. Um, you might be concerned about poverty and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a really obvious way in which social class matters because it seems to determine income. Um, and I'll talk more about this life chances, um, access that people have to credentials and education. Um, and that's the most common way in which people think class matters. But I was interested in it for a slightly different reason, which is that people in my field don't take that much of an interest in class. So I will actually be interested to know what you all think, because um, I actually wrote this paper for people, for social philosophers who don't think systematically about class or economics very much. Um, so the economy itself is sort of an abstract thing governed by um, rules and models. And it's not something that a lot of philosophers engage systematically with. Um, so I realized that this was a problem, however, because there's a deficit in contemporary thinking about social class compared to basically every other social category. So this might um, sound odd because we often say that we're interested in oppression, we're interested in racial um, discrimination, ethnic discrimination, gender discrimination. Um, and obviously class is a part of maybe one axis of oppression or prejudice or bias among others. And so we often lift it with those other categories. So people are aware that it's important but I started to notice that um, class was actually not theorized systematically at all by social philosophers. And this is in stark contrast to gender and race. So where I come from in the US, there is several decades of theorizing um, at length and robustly about gender and race. And it is not, and when I published my paper on class, it was an accurate statement to say that this was the only paper published on the topic of social class itself in philosophy in at least 40 years. So I wanted to understand why this deficit, if it's the case that class, race, and gender, for example, and maybe also with sexuality, is like class fits so naturally with those other categories. We are interested in um, you know, the, the way in which people are multiply oppressed or the different kind of categories that people fit into. Why is it just this category that is that people are not interested in theorizing in a more robust way? Um, because when I put it to you like that, that after 40 years, there is no philosophy paper about class. There is some about exploitation, but not about class properly. I think since John Romer about a paper, wrote a paper about it in like 1982. Um, this is um, kind of striking. And I think the reason for it is a little bit, it has to do with the history of how people who are now interested in race and gender kind of came to their own theoretical development. And they had a background in the new left. So the social movements in the 1960s and the 1970s that were busy, that really contested um, a particular way of thinking about class in the Marxian tradition, and then continuously argued that 
class um, was thinking about social class was reductive and they wanted to have a more robust view of social oppression beyond class. That's really the, the key word is beyond going beyond it. Um, so people started thinking about class as a real limit on their theorizing and um, some objections, as I'll discuss in a, uh, in a moment, to the way that Marxists in particular thought about class became very de rigueur throughout the academy. So um, I don't exactly know where the people in this workshop kind of fit into the disciplines, but it is just a fact that when you read about Marxism or about class, it's almost like you don't talk about it without already talking about the limits of the concept, con the concepts and what they do and don't explain. So that's why there's very little exploration of the concept because there was a certain way of thinking about class that was sort of taken for granted. And then as time moved on, people just kind of assumed that that way of thinking about class was legitimate but insufficient. And then no one felt the need to fill in anything else, to add any more detail, to, to theorize it about it more thoroughly. Now, this is not true, I think, in sociology, which I think there are some social, and I draw on them in my paper. There are social scientists who have indeed thought great, very deeply about class, but for my audience, this was about um, social philosophy and that's distinct. And so what I did is try to bring some of the theoretical insights um, from the social sciences into a paper about class and to make a normative argument about why it matters. So um, this may be familiar to you, especially if you're familiar with um, social, like um, income inequality studies or stratification theory in sociology. Um, but I think there's basically two main ways of thinking about class, two dominant ways in any case. Um, I think you could nuance this and just like ask, you know, what about Bordeaux or something like that. But um, I think there are two dominant ways of thinking about this, which is that on the one hand, there is stratification theory. And on the other hand, there is class conflict theory. Stratification theory is more closely aligned with mainstream economics and sociology. Class, con um, class conflict theory is usually aligned with um, the Marxian tradition or maybe the um, Weberian tradition as well. So um, stratification theory sees class as a continuous variable. What that means is that it can be deter like analytically thought about in an infinite number of ways. It kind of depends on what you're interested in. So it could be determined by um, education, income levels, sometimes even lifestyle var uh, variations. And I think the way that you can see what I mean by this is that if you look at you know, charts in which people talk about um, um, income inequality, the way people define class for, in stratification theory just varies an enormous amount. You can talk about the differences in income or wealth, um, like you can say, okay, here's what the top 10% of the population has relative to the 90%, the 1% and the 99%. You can talk about the bottom 50% of the population if you want to emphasize how like they own less wealth than the top 10%. You can, you can figure, like it depends on what you want to emphasize about the social structure. And so class can have a lot of different meanings. Um, but what it most consistently reflects and apologies for the ambulance outside. Um, what it most consistently reflects is a set of distributive patterns, kind of where people have ended up in the class structure. So usually you're kind of describing the result and inferring causes from that. Um, it can reflect consumption patterns. And as I said, education and cultural resources. Um, and I think most importantly, it reflects what opportunities people have to take advantage of on the market. Um, I'll say more about the normative in a moment, um, but I think the primary normative um, questions and like, and by that, I mean, like moral, ethical, political, like how things should be, is like people are trying to figure out what's fair and unfair, who has an unfair advantage or disadvantage. And usually we talk about discrimination, bias, prejudice in this context, because um, you're trying to find out what is morally justified and then what is morally arbitrary. Okay. And people have differing opinions about that in normative political philosophy. 
Class conflict theory, by contrast, thinks about class as a categorical variable. Um, what this means is that it's they think it reflects something um, objective about the social structure. So it's not up to the theorist to decide where people are sorted based on their research question. It is a fact about the social structure that classes exist and what the theorist is trying to do is understand the relationship among them. Um, this comes along with the idea that there are microdynamics within the social structure that gener generate um, macrodynamic patterns. Normally, you know, so there's an analysis of social positioning, again, that isn't determined ahead of time by the theorist, but that actually exists in the world. So there's a kind of um, uh, philosoph a phil philosophical or scientific realism about this kind of um, inquiry. And so wherever people are positioned in the social structure, how they interact as individuals within firms, within labor market sectors, maybe sometimes within groups, um, this is going to generate macrodynamic patterns that are related to that, that you can relate back and attribute um, causally in some sense to the micro foundations. This warrants a really different way of looking at political agency because you start emphasizing constraint as opposed to opportunity. And obviously opportunities also exist, but they're always relative to the constraints of social positioning. And you start seeing class more as an intrinsic harm as opposed to something that like um, might be fair or unfair. Because if it's the case that it's rooted that deeply in the social structure and it's not just about, and like you start asking, well, maybe that's arbitrary, like people aren't responsible for how they are placed in the social structure, then this view is gonna be much closer to um, a stronger condemnation of class divisions and not just class inequalities. So this is gonna lend itself to what is often inferred as like a more structural analysis, if that word helps. It's a metaphor, obviously, but um, it can be useful. So the normative argument from a class conflict theory perspective is always going to be about freedom and domination. Because if you think class is an intrinsic harm, um, not unlike you might think that racism is an intrinsic harm, okay, that there's just something unjustified about it, then your question is going to be st start being along the lines of domination and how to overcome it completely, um, not how to find what about it is arbitrary or not arbitrary. Okay, so it's a, and I think it's important to draw out these distinctions because they are um, one side of this ledger. Okay, if you look on the right-hand side of the screen, at least my right-hand side, um, the class conflict theory has a much higher burden on it than the other side. So the stratification theory doesn't make claims about political agency. It doesn't root conflict kind of deeply within um, different, differently positioned social groups. And there's no claim about who is oppressing who. So class conflict theory is much more vulnerable to a higher stakes. Well, it has a higher set of stakes normatively and social theoretically, and then it's much more vulnerable to criticisms um, than the opposing view, which is much more flexible. Okay, so that's important for um, sort of understanding the critiques of class conflict theory, and they don't get lodged for the most part against stratification theory in the same way. So um, in general, there is a substantive critique, I think that lends itself to a norm norm normative critique about class conflict theory. Now, I, again, I don't exactly know where people in this audience have had exposure to the idea of class conflict. Like it could be um, in seminars, it could be in political environments, it could be um, in industrial relations scholarship. I don't know. Maybe you have experience with trade unions. Um, but if you think along these lines, some objections start to um, present themselves very quickly, which is that if you think that, um, or actually, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to back up part of the normative stakes of this project. And I forgot to say this, this is very important. Um, when you start talking about intrinsic harms and the relationship to political agency in the Marxian tradition, this warrants an argument about why 
working class people, unemployed people, and their dependents need have an interest in coming together politically. Okay, so if you're a, if you're dominated together, and you are in a position to get together and engage in collective action to ameliorate the conditions of your domination or to overcome them, then this is what you should do. And this is a strategy to challenge domination on a societal scale. So sorry for the back and forth, but I realized when I was going on that I didn't like quite get you to the right um, point, but maybe you already inferred that because if you know something about Marxism, you know that it's about workers of the world unite. So there's a point here. Um, now, the problem with this view and why the stakes are so high and why it's so easy to criticize is that obviously there are lots of conflicts among working people. It is not the case that working people immediately identify with one another, that they immediately engage in collective action. And maybe this is like a little bit um, off kilter from some of the European experience where like I think a basic level of like, you know, acceptance of trade unions and so on is more um, accepted. But in most of the world, that is just not true. Like working people are profoundly disorganized for the most part. Um, like where I come from in the US, it's like, I think 12% union density. Um, it's just not the case that this is automatic or that um, it emerges like progressively with, ta with time. So it's also the case that there is Diff opposing and different interests within the working class. And when we're talking about, you know, the kinds of criticisms that I'm addressing in this paper and how they relate to why I was initially thinking about class to begin with, it has to do with, of course, the working class has racial and gender divisions within it became the really dominant um, critique in social philosophy of Marxism and of class conflict theory in general. And their argument was that, okay, these there are more divisions within the working class and the working class is not homogenous. Um, they are, you know, there are housewives, for example, at the time in the 1970s, it was like there are women who are dependent on their husbands and husbands seem to have a different interest than their wives. Um, white workers would in, exclude black workers from industries, um, maybe in apartheid conditions in the US or South Africa. Um, people started realizing that there was, were more um, be better positioned workers in a place countries like Germany as compared to um, developing countries. And there was, there was, it wasn't obvious why any of these people should have the same interests. In fact, they, they might not have the same interests. And the criticism was that class conflict theory had a very simple and dichotomous idea of, of power. Um, so they just thought about power between capital and workers, and they didn't consider the other social divisions and that I just mentioned, gender and race and ethnicity or um, geography. And therefore they had an extremely, as it's called, as it's called reductive view of social class um, and oppression and domination in general. And so this warranted then a normative critique, which is that Marxism is exclusionary, authoritarian, and um, because they, they were not willing to consider these broader interests um, and concerns. And then also, um, the following, like the kind of follow up to that is that workers have no unique claim to self determination, whereas Marxists used to think about them as the potential agents of transformative or even revolutionary change. Um, that they had a, a common set of goal the interests that could turn into goal political goals that they could become a collective political subject. Um, the argument was that this wasn't true. Like women and minorities have just as much a right to a claim to self-determination as workers. There's nothing unique about the position of workers given that they can be so exclusionary, authoritarian and non-pluralistic and non-inclusive in their movements. Um, so I titled this slide class conflict theory and it's discontent because there are an awful lot of discontents and in philosophy there aren't that many defend, dis, um, defenders of the theory. But what's interesting and why I started by talking about the new left and the deficit in class theory in social philosophy is that most of these criticisms by feminists or critical philosophers of race, um, they actually normally take for granted some part of the Marxian story. Like they hitch their wagon to Marxism by saying that they're gonna go beyond it. Um, they wanna overcome the limitations of this kind of 
view. But as I mentioned, they usually then put class in the back seat. like, okay, Marx figured that out. And what we need to do now is think about race and gender. Um, so what I started being frustrated by in this discussion is that I just don't think that that is a helpful approach. Um, and I, I, I think that on the one hand, it's right to say that if you can't acknowledge um, forms of domination that are not reducible to class differences, then you might call the theory reductive, right? You, you can't presuppose that one factor can explain everything. You have to look at concrete situations and see what the dominant causal variable might be, and there might be numerous, okay? But then the second thing that I thought is um, it's also strangely reductive to have a concept of class like this, like class conflict theory lingering in the background of your view, and then to never mobilize it or reconstruct it or use it to shed any light on um, these other angles of oppression in, in a way that's equally as rigorous as you would these other concepts. So um, I started thinking that class was kind of, it was kind of like a sleeping giant, you know, like a bear that's sleeping in a cave. And if you were to think about poking the bear, you might ask, what would it say if it woke up? You know, like what would it shed, what kind of light would it shed on our social theory, on our analysis, if this was actually taken seriously as a, a live topic of discussion and debate, as opposed to an archaic set of concepts that we just sort of refer to in the background. Um, and I, th I think it might be sort of difficult to see this point because it took quite a bit of experience with this literature to realize that all of the references to social class were actually at um, a very superficial level. You say, okay, okay, Marx got that right, but then he didn't get everything else right. And so what we wanna do is tend to everything else. So I started realizing that gender and race were doing all of the work, whereas class was just kind of a background tableau, like a blank canvas picture. Um, and then race and gender were kind of acting on it. Like, okay, there's inequality, but then workers are really racist or husbands are really sexist. And then, then we get a more differentiated picture. Um, now, if you're an economic student, you probably know that that is just not how the economy works. Conditions change all the time. Um, it is a very dynamic system. It is subject to constraints and um, patterns of development that um, are not reducible to just people's biases and prejudices uh, shaping the divisions within the class structure, okay? This is actually a social dynamic that um, dictates the conditions of much of our lives. So it's odd to not mobilize it, okay? So I wanted to figure out um, and hopefully constructively, like what would it mean to make class matter again in a social analysis? Um, but I had to go through a set of alternatives to kind of show why I think that some of um, the way people try to do that is not usually um, that satisfying. Normally, and again, if you are in a sociology department or adjacent to it, this will sound quite familiar to you. Um, I think the two main alternatives are multiple systems theory, um, which is really, it might be kind of old fashioned now in the sense that it was very popular in the 70s and the 80s, um, and Vivarian theories, which I think are really the dominant way that sort of people who want to think about class and race and gender together tend to think about the issue. Um, multiple systems theory is the, 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 these common sense ideas where we start talking about different systems intertwining, being mutually constituting, um, intersecting. Okay, so the idea is that um, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism are distinct systems that represent distinct interest sets in society, um, different types of preference um, De like default preference setting. So workers have an interest with workers and they want to fight capitalists. White people have an interest with other white people and they want to subordinate people of color. Men have an interest with other men and they want to subordinate women. Um, 
this is, I think, something that is often under analyzed. Today, people talk about systems in a very casual way, and there's a sense in which it's fine to do that, like the criminal justice system, the foster care system, the welfare system. I mean, there's lots of systems, and it can be meaningful to talk about different institutions and the systems within them. What I'm talking about are the kind of big three, patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. These these are the kinds of systems that are not reducible to their discrete institutional settings. Okay, so if you say that that there's white supremacy, what you're saying is that um, it's not just a particular government that is white supremacist, you're saying that there's a system in society that is um, shaping and driving a macro dynamic that disadvantages or supre- or subordinates people of color. Okay, so that's like you're you're saying that there's a system logic there. Likewise with patriarchy, and um, likewise with capitalism. So these these would be analogous to what Marx famously called the laws of motion of the system. That you can find out basically a basic pattern of incentives and a motivational structure that reproduces a system. Um, The problem with this kind of view, and I think, you know, I'll be interested to know what you think about it um, because I think it's kind of coming back into fashion, but finding what is distinct about each of those systems aside from capitalism is actually quite difficult to do. So what it mostly ends up doing is bifurcating sort of mental activity like prejudice and bias against Um, material activity, which is economic. Um, So, and and socialist feminists were really good at kind of getting to the bottom of this debate. They thought there were two systems, patriarchy and capitalism. And then over time, they started thinking, okay, but what really makes patriarchy distinct as a system? Like there, everyone is in a different class position and surely the relations of production or the conditions of production or the labor market or the consu- you know the commodity market these shape the relations in the family the access people have to resources so what does it even mean to say that these are like distinct that there are two separate system logics here okay so that was ended up not being satisfying the other view that's more um, well known in the social sciences would be a kind of neo weberian view which is that yes, there are different resources within the labor market and um, they are, it, it's true that people um, have differential access to those resources, but what's really important is that in a competitive market, people can hoard the resources from one another and they can disadvantage people um, from having the same life chances. So the most obvious example of this would be like hoarding credentials or skills. So you can think about like older fashioned uh, like unions in the beginning of the 20th or late 19th century, where they would really organize along artisan or craft lines and they would militantly keep people out of um, uh, the uh, apprenticeships and out of just whatever avenue they would take to attain the skills because they wanted to have a kind of monopoly on those resources. And so you know, Weber is very similar to Marx in the sense that he really takes the dynamics of competition and class class differentiation seriously is like people really are positioned differently within the market. And this is a process that generates conflict. But he mostly also thinks about it in terms of different opportunities that people can take advantage of at the expense of others, which can generate inequality. And importantly for Weber, something like the means of production, you know, capital goods themselves or raw materials or factories or whatever, those are not privileged resources that generate macro dynamics. Okay, those are just like one type of resource. Um, so normally for a Weberian perspective, what goes on is that workers are exploited, but then they also try to usurp resources from each other. Um, so there's a, a kind of dual, um, Frank Parkin is a sociologist who calls this a process of dual closure. So yeah, workers are excluded from the means of production um, vis-a-vis capital, but they exclude each other from different resources as well. And so the class structure is more varied. Um, the, um, I think the problem with this is fundamentally that it doesn't, re- like that symmetry that Weber makes between productive goods and productive resources and other kinds of resources. 
is just um, really misleading. Um, I think that the, the main intuition of the class conflict view in the Marxian tradition is that the monopoly over those the, the resources at the point of production generates macro dynamics that um, create the terrain in which these other closures and resource hoarding takes place. Um, so if you have questions about that, I'm going to move on, but you know, we can talk about it more in the discussion, but that's my objection to Viverian class theory. And then the alternative is, of course, um, that there are just no systems at all. So when I say that these are the main alternatives, multiple systems theory or Viverian theories, I think that these are the dominant common sense ways people think about this. They are the ways that have been best articulated and they are often implicitly a part of the view that people adopt, even if they don't say so. Unless they have more post-structuralist sensibilities and they just do not think that you can talk about system lo systems logic, logics in a meaningful way. And that's just not the audience of this paper. But if you have questions about it, um, I'm happy to, to try to respond to them. Um, so I wanted to diagnose what is basically the, the problem with, like, why is it the case that people could not um, think about the class structure in a more robust way? And then they're like driven to these other alternatives, like multiple systems theory, which I think is more or less um, has a lot of like theory imminent problems to it. It would be very hard to deploy that in a systematic way. And like a, a, to make come up with an explanation of anything in particular. Um, and the Viverian view is also, is I think closer to the mark, but also has this deficiency that I mentioned. And so the result of that, of, of this um, set of alternatives is that people tend to just, like I said, add on variables to the class structure to make sense of a complex reality and are not really interested in reconceptualizing class so that the concept can become more, more useful. And I think that the main problem is that people have a really strong um, dichotomy in their minds conceptually between what counts as economic and what counts as non-economic. So if the economic part of the equation can't explain the non-economic, so say race and gender, then it's like, you have to add on to it. And I started seeing a really a resonance between this way of thinking and what I, th I think is um, the, the main, I, the, the, the basics of a neoclassical view on what counts as what, how to define and conceptualize and um, uh, construct models of the economy. And I wanna be clear that like, I'm not an economist um, I have like some basic familiarity with this, but I'm, I'm really interested in the conceptual structure. So I'm not interested in telling you that you can't use neoclassical economic models. I know some people who do want to tell you that, but I am not trying to tell you that. I am trying to figure out why this way of thinking about markets or about capitalism creates like conceptual roadblocks for people like me who are interested in doing social criticism or critique. Okay, so if it's useful to make a model to kind of prescribe some kind of uh, policy or outcome in the world, like more power to you. But I am interested in like critiquing these kind of pervasive um, inequalities in the world and what I think is better described as domination. And I want to try to have a better conceptual framework that lets me do that. And I think the main problem with these other theories of class that I mentioned is that they maintain this sort of inside and outside distinction of what counts as economic and non-economic. And they basically get this from a pretty uh, a, a set of concepts that I'm sure you are all familiar with. Um, I think the model of perfect competition implies that um, there, that most of what is going on in the world is imperfect and that the problem is, is that reality is kind of impinging on the model of perfect competition. And so when things don't work out the way the model predicts, then it must be an externality that is causing that or something in the model that needs to be adjusted when reality doesn't reflect it. And what I started noticing is that this idea of both perfect competition and the implied imperfections 
And then subsequent idea of market failures, which I won't explain because I assume this audience knows something about that, is that the things that are like most important to social philosophers of the kind I'm describing almost always fall into the category of what of an imperfection or an ex externality um, that is not directly attributable to economic dynamics in themselves. Um, so I started realizing that what perfect competition does and the model of market failures, which tries to kind of ameliorate some of um, the, 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 the evident problems of the lack of correspondence of perfect competition with the world is that it's actually idealizing certain parts of the market. Um, and this is different from an abstraction. I wanna be clear about this because there's not necessarily a problem with abstracting. There is a problem if you're interested in social criticism with idealizing certain um, aspects of a social reality that you're trying to examine and analyze and then reifying those um, qualities like they are neutral or positive um, when, and this can obscure other dynamics. And so I started asking myself, okay, what is one thing that all of these people seem to assume? The one thing that my interlocutors seem to assume is that the market is basically like indifferent to identity. So if the market is indifferent to identity, then something else must be causing sexism and racism. Um, and I just started thinking like, is that true? Is it true that the market is basically indifferent to the identity or that it doesn't reinforce prejudices or if it doesn't, um, that it doesn't play an active role in reproducing these things. Because the idea, um, if you think that, that um, if you adopt the basic like decision-making model in which preferences are basically fixed and everybody is transparent to themselves and they know all their options and all firms are price takers and so on and so forth. And you don't assume that there is our large firms, there are many small firms and everybody knows exactly what's going on and preferences are basically fixed then you have decided on which aspects of the market are relevant to the inquiry from the beginning. And if it doesn't match that, then it's imperfect. But it seems that real life people have a lot more going on with them. And it might be useful for the, um, for the sake of social critique to kind of break that down and to kind of dismantle the logic of externalities that this seems to produce for the sake of asking what it does it really, like what does social class actually contribute to these other, um, to reproducing these other opp oppressions? Because if it's based on the model of perfect competition, the answer is it just can't. Something external to that has to be producing racism and sexism. And I started finding this increasingly um, implausible. So um, I started calling this a black box problem where like you idealize certain aspects of the market and then everything that is doesn't fit that idealization um, just becomes the non-ideal or as it's called the imperfect. And I think this actually creates a black box out of the economy. So the real social dynamics within it, the real living people um, with contradictory values and expectations and conflicts among them don't really enter the stage. And I think this, this is basically what goes on and then gets reflected at the level of social philosophy when people are like, hmm, why is there, are there so many racial disparities within the labor market? Crazy. It must be that white workers are just so rabidly racist that they are just excluding that black people from skills and resources. Um, so at least that would be the debate equivalent in the United States. So, um, I wanted to say, like, what is a different way of conceptualizing the economy so that this becomes less like mystifying, obscurantist, and obtuse, so that we stop positioning the economic and the non-economic in such an awkward dichotomy. And I started thinking that maybe if we think about this more like a social practice, we that we would help ourselves analytically speaking. Um, so I'll let you ask, I don't want to, I have maybe two more slides and, or so, and I don't want to make you um, take too much time away from the discussion. So you can ask me more about the social practice view um, then, but I wanted to basically go inside economic practices instead of assuming what I think I know about them already. And again, idealizing certain aspects 
of market behavior and assuming that preferences are fixed, I wanted to say that this, I, I wanted to see what would it mean to try to imagine or conceptualize um, how people with a whole host of values and preferences, how they relate to the basic constraints that competitive markets place upon them. What would allow me to think more deeply about this? And I started thinking that what would allow me to open the black box is a practice theoretical account in which I start thinking about market behavior as basically an informal, repeated, or rule-governed behavior. It's not the same thing as an institution. Like These can be embedded in different institutions, and institutions can organize them differently. I'm talking about the fundamentals of, of market behavior. So when you're thinking like, you know, I'm going to do a, a game theoretical model about like this guy selling wheat and this other person selling corn and like what's going to benefit them both. I'm talking about like that kind of fundamental economic interaction, not um, yet embedded in institutions. And I started thinking that like all of these interactions already are already normatively laden. They have normative expectations that are embedded within them. And these create the set of resources that people use to kind of to solve problems within the market. So people are competing for jobs, they are competing for skills, they're competing for credentials. Um, and then all of these practices come along with normative expectations of dessert, of entitlement, um, of what merits a just reward, for instance. And so this isn't just um, a rational, like a rational choice theory situation like there I mean it is about rational choices but it's also about how expectations and norms develop over time in a path dependent way within social structures in which people are engaging in market driven behavior and people importantly need to solve problems like they are dependent on the labor market they need access to work they need to find ways to get access to the means of subsistence in Marxian language, and they have to um, basically engage in a set of strategies, but also use normative resources within these practices to try um, to do the best they can, basically. Um, and I think that the idea of a practice is kind of vague. So what I've started elaborating is that a practice in the, this context is actually more like, a, I, I want to specify that it's a structural practice. So for instance, um, a doctor engages in the pra practice of administering medical care. Okay. And there are obviously norms in this, involved in this practice. Like you would think that a doctor is a bad doctor if they're a family practitioner, if they just like don't care about their patients. Like they don't care about whether or not they're like well-being. You would think you're not a very good doctor. And moreover, you're not going to be successful at being a doctor because if you neglect your patients and you misdiagnose them and you cause more problems for them than you are able to help, then you're just not a good doctor and you can't be a doctor. Okay. Di you know, differently, if you're a surgeon, that might not matter because you don't have to engage with the patients in the same way. You're just fixing a problem um, in a different setting. I think that these kinds of practices and normative expectations of different social roles are very important, but there's something distinct about what it means to um, be a working person or a capitalist and be in a relationship between these two in a capitalist economy, which is if you're a capitalist, you are engaging in a practice like a doctor in which you have certain resources and you need to, you need to figure out how to, um, you know, in this case, keep your firm afloat, um, be able to have a certain rate of profit, work, make people work efficiently and so on. But unlike a doctor who can treat patients in any given kind of way, I mean, like, and by that, I mean, they could work for a nonprofit organization, they could work for a private, they could have a private practice. Um, they could make house calls, they could like, you know, work for one rich person and be their private, you know, you could be Jeff Bezos's private doctor, for example. Um, being a doctor can have a d many different iterations and, and can be a practice in different ways. A capitalist 
being in that role entails treating um, a set of interests and a, a motivational structure and a way of treating working class people, I think in an antagonistic way that is just not true of being a doctor. So when I say there's a structural practice, there's a much stronger connection with social positionality and constraint. Um, and I started thinking that if that's true, right, if I reconstruct the idea of economic behavior in terms of a practice, then I might be able to drop this perfect and imperfect framework for the purposes of social criticism. And um, I started thinking about the ways in which the process of capitalist production affects working people, how they react, and how they try to solve the problems that are created therein. So for instance, um, if you are dependent on the labor market, then you are subject to your employer deploy like, um, developing new technologies, so technological innovation, um, you uh, increases in labor productivity, that workers are going to be pushed from capital intensive to labor intensive industries. Um, so changing conditions of production shifts and like, you know, skill mismatches and um, some parts of the workforce will become redundant and not others. And I started thinking, what if I didn't assume perfect competition in the background and this inside outside dynamic? What would it tell me about what, um, about basically the social, like the robust social nature of all of this? And I think what it tells me is that workers are gonna start facing a contradictory reality. There are changing conditions of production, you know, they're the product of like real capitalist competition in the world. And then there are justifications and expectations that they have, like there are the justifications employers give them that other people, you know, sometimes um, the media or what, it, like the justifications in society at large for what is happening. And then there's also their own expectations, okay, of how hard they work what they deserve. Like, you know, I put 30 years of my life into this country uh, or into this company, and then my job became redundant and I don't deserve to be treated this way, okay? Um, if this is more a more accurate representation of people's desires and what they might expect and the conditions in which they might expect certain outcomes, then you can start to expect um, people to try to resolve some of these problems in ways that are um, very heterogeneous. So one strategy is, of course, um, to not to just, you know, compete as an individual and like, you know, be on good terms with your boss and to be very competitive. Another option is collective action of some kind at varying scales. Um, and I think that these are different ways of making sense of these changing conditions and expectations. So I started asking myself, if this is maybe a more accurate way of thinking about how people really experience these dynamics, like the problem solving and the strategizing and even the rational choice stuff is happening under conditions that are, that are um, real, necessarily imperfect, like so there is no perfect, then you have this highly precarious and contested dynamic in which people are gonna do the best they can to get what they can out of the process. Um, and working people are going to be uniquely vulnerable in this process. So what do I mean by that? Working people are gonna be dependent on the labor market and subject to competitive constraints with one another. Um, they need access to the labor market and they might be more willing to, um, as Vivarians say, hoard resources, exclude each other from certain corners of the labor market or skill sets. But what I have now made sense of is the terrain on which that takes place is one in which they are already um, um, experiencing uh, pressures toward fragmentation and heterogeneity and in which it's not obvious okay, right away as an individual how to handle those pressures. But importantly, they're in a position where they can't handle it as individuals. The only way for working people um, to change these conditions at the level of, like, at a system level, so whether it's in a firm and probably not even in a firm, it probably has to be in a whole labor market sector, 
or a geographical region, the only way to influence these dynamics, aside from succeeding as an individual, is collectively. Um, so that's why we have labor unions and so on and so forth is because working people basically figure this out at some point. And so there is a way in which working class people are dependent on each other for an adequate response to changing conditions of production. And these are very adverse circumstances and that makes them collectively vulnerable. And importantly, it means that there is an intrinsic tendency towards disequilibrium, destabilization, and precarity within the working class. And to the extent that they're able to mitigate that through collective action, um, that's to their credit. It's not a natural outgrowth of the system. I started realizing that people usually attribute to capitalism the, um, the, the positive qualities that are actually the result of struggles against capitalism. And maybe I feel this way rather strongly because I did not grow up in an environment in which labor unions are normal. And so it's never been obvious to me that solidarity is like guaranteed among workers. It's just not like everyone is terrified to join a union. Laws are very repressive. It's very difficult to do. And so I always thought, well, if they're able to overcome all of this and form a kind of counterculture of solidarity and kind of solve a problem collectively, well, this is just an incredible thing that workers have been able to do over time. It's not guaranteed and it's not inevitable. Okay, so I've, I started thinking there is no intra-class conflict problem here. The default situation here is competition and lack of solidarity and to the extent which people are able to remedy that, it's to their credit. Um, and of course, they might not be able to remedy that, okay? It might not be the case and they might, or they might do so insufficiently. Um, and then these kinds of fragmentations within the, the working class emerge. So where might ideas like sexism and racism come from in this context? Um, I think I only have one more slide, so I'll be done momentarily. Um, I think that if it's the case that there's a normative structure within the economy and that people engage in these competitive pr practices and they start having ideas about what they deserve to get out of it, what's fair and unfair, um, because importantly, the expectation is that you compete with equals on the market, then um, you might start to adapt those dominant norms that are somehow egalitarian or identity neutral. You might start to adapt them to justify strategies of clo closure or strategies of individual success. And what this is basically does is it starts to naturalize inequalities that are inevitable products of the social structure itself. So one group of people will think, aha, well, you know, if you, I worked hard, you can work hard. So why aren't you working hard? It means something about you. Um, and I think that the common thing that a lot of um, what we normally call discrimination um, or racism or sexism have in common is simply that it turns um, equality on its head. So once you start thinking about people in terms of like these weird naturalized um, characteristics and you start essentializing the group. So you might say that women are unreliable. Um, one group of workers is lazy and so on. Um, and conversely, when workers tend to militate against that, they come up with alternative norms of solidarity, which is what the collective action does. It gives them a different perspective on these competitive constraints that they're on or that they are under. So in sum, why does class matter? Um, I've given you a lot of information. I think my article is sort of dense. I hope you were able to follow it. Um, here's the, the payoff or the upshot here is that if it's the case that the labor market, unlike perhaps what more orthodox Marxists thought, okay, if they indeed thought something like this and what their critics thought, if it's the case that solidarity within the labor market and within the class structure is guaranteed to nobody, okay, not even white workers, not even privileged workers, nobody, and that if we don't idealize market competition as kind of bringing people together and allowing them to identify with one another and creating equality of opportunity, then 
that is an enormous social problem, I think. Um, a society that subjects people to a structure that makes them, that is kind of endemically conflictual, that disrupts and antagonizes attempts at social solidarity. Um, my intuition is that this is a really deep ethical problem. This is a moral problem. It's an ethical problem. And I didn't really explore the ethical dimensions of it in my paper, but the intuit, the idea that we have a social structure that keeps us from being in solidarity with one another, unless we're able to do something um, about that, like what a way to live, you know, that's pretty wild. Um, but I think the more substantive point, normatively speaking, is that it subjects people to the arbitrary prerogatives of capital um, and it forces them to have to address these um, problems and these, um, these conflicts in the vertical class structure under deeply adverse conditions. And finally, um, I think what we're talking about here is domination and not inequality. And importantly, and the reason that my argument um, is really different than what has come before, is that I argue that it's because and in spite of differences among working people. The differences tell us something more about the domination. They aren't a limitation on um, class conflict theory. Okay, I think that's all I have. So I will take your, your questions. Um, I hope that was helpful. Okay, um, thanks. We haven't gotten any, any questions, uh, questions in the Q&A tool so far. So um, everybody feel free to put your questions in there or you can raise your hand and I'll hopefully see that and uh, then you can, can ask your question. And um, yeah, maybe while everybody gets gets ready, one one thing that might be helpful to to clarify, I think, is um, the way we we actually define class. I mean, you talked about um, class class conflict uh, theory, um, but I think here maybe a lot of people might be unfamiliar with the ways um, Marxists talk about class in in general and what we what we mean by that, and um, also what we mean by uh, terms like like capitalism. If you could uh, say say a few things about that. Sure. Okay. So um, in the first slide, I can go back to one of the slides if that would help um, and kind of break it down a little better. Um, hmm. Okay, so I think maybe I took for granted um, that there might be some familiar, familiarity with class conflict theory because the audience I wrote the paper for um, does kind of have some familiarity with it. And my point was to kind of draw out a contrast between class and stratification, this kind of view and stratification theory with which you're probably more familiar. Um, but the way that Marxists have historically defined class is in relate like working people and capitalists. So the proletariat and the capitalist class, they have a different relationship to what is normally called the means of production. So when you think, what do we use to produce and reproduce our lives together? Um, you have to think about things like raw materials, transport, factories. So what you normally think about is probably like capital goods. Um, or intermediate goods. Either these are the things that in the process in which they all come together, capitalists own that for the most part. Okay, or the, the board of the firm does, or the uh, or the major shareholder, stakeholder, shareholder. Um, so there is an owner ownership structure that is what defines the categories in which people are, are going to fall into. So capitalists have ownership over those things and workers do not, okay? Working people by and large, okay? Unless they're able to amass some small property in homes and so on, um, but that those aren't capital goods. They don't own the means of their own subsistence. They aren't able to like work a plot of land anymore for the most part and come up with them and be able to fulfill all of their needs in that setting, okay? So 
for example, agriculture is very industrialized. Like you might have a little family plot and you might grow your vegetables, but for the most part, you are producing for the market um, and only for the market. So capital capitalism is different from other modes of production. That's the language Marx uses because people produce exclusively for exchange and not for their own subsistence. So people have to work for access to like wages and um, uh, maybe something, you know, salaries in order to buy commodities on the market. So all of the means of subsistence are located in the sphere of market exchange and everyone involved is dependent on the market. Okay, so like capital depends on market competition for profit and workers depend on labor market competition and the success of the firms they work for in order to like to, to get wages and to be able to buy their consumption bundle you know, like whatever they can afford relative to um, like whatever wages are relative to the rest of the prices in the economy. Um, so that's how I would describe the, the fundamental dynamics of capitalism, that everybody is dependent on the labor market and everybody has to compete. No, it's dependent on the market and everyone has to compete within it to be able to reproduce their own lives, but there are really different incentive structures going on here. So workers have to compete with one another for access to the means of subsistence, okay? And this includes unemployed people, okay? So it's never the case that the labor market can absorb everybody. Um, sometimes policies of full employment have been you know, uh, deployed in, in various advanced capitalist countries, but for the most part, there is a stable unemployment rate, even in those contexts. And globally, there's a huge informal labor market sector and capital like rarely is able to absorb all of that labor. Um, and then capital um, is dependent on the market to be able to produce for exchange and to be able to capture market shares and probably those things that are a bit more familiar to, to people who are interested in economics. Um, and so the way that Marx has defined the class structure is those different positions relative to the kind of competition people have to engage in. And then um, how people go about doing that is what um, kind of lends itself to the tendencies of the system. So capitalists have an incentive to uh, have a certain rate, maintain a certain rate, rate of profit. They're gonna have incentive to then increase labor productivity, technological in innovation, and so on. And what I have tried to describe here um, is that this has a pretty distinct effect on working people. So what Marx usually calls the dull compulsions of economic relations, this, these, the fact that you have to kind of, you have to leave your house every day, you have to go to work or now you can stay home, I guess. But um, these are things that you are compelled to do because you need to be able to take home wages in order to get a certain bundle of consumption goods. And the point that Marxists have historically made is that these micro dynamics, these things people are compelled to do based on their situation within the market, they um, evolve into macro dynamics of the system. So these aspects of the labor market that I've described in which, you know, the technological innovation of the capitalist might make some workers redundant. This isn't, this is an, a natural, this is a logical outgrowth of the incentive structure that capitalists in fact have to remain competitive in their own way. Jonas, does that help? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I was uh, preoccupied there for a moment. I'm um, sorry. So um, we've gotten one question so far. Um, and this person is asking um, uh, whether you think we can basically get, get out of this uh, dilemma by changing our economic system and uh, what alternative kind of system you would have in mind. Well, I think that in the most, I'll just say this in the most general broadest sense. I think that what is useful about the Marxian class theory, you know, wherever you fall on like what kind of alternative you want, like there are lots of debates about this, but I think it helps one to see clearly 
at the very least, the kinds of incentives and motivational structures that need to be constrained or challenged in order to have a more egalitarian society. And I think if you're somebody who wants an actual alternative, like a different way of a different kind of economy, then you have to think in terms of a rupture with those incentives and motivations. Okay. You have to change the ownership structure so that different macro dynamic patterns emerge that are more egalitarian or simply more, um, you know, morally or ethically acceptable to the population. Um, so I'm not going to say exactly what I want because I, to me, it's kind of an open question. There are debates about market socialism. There have obviously been socialist experiments that have tried to do these things with better, you know, some with not good success at all, some with some success for a period of time. Um, but I think what this kind of way of thinking about class trains your attention to is that if you can be one to the idea that class conflict and class divisions are a deep problem, then it trains your attention on how to change this, the underlying structure as opposed to um, you know, just accepting inequality in the structure and trying to, to mitigate it, which can also be a good thing. But the, 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 the goals change accordingly, I think, to how you think about social class. Okay, yeah. Uh, the next question is um, uh, whether there's a, a way to explain why um, maybe why there's a different view on union, trade unions in, in the US and why they are more rare. Yeah. Um, let me like think about this momentarily. Okay. So um, the class structure in the US just evolved idiosyncratically and you know as all class structures do every geographical location is different but in particular um it had a um the the local economy was divided right in between a sort of pe peasant producing artisanal like nascent industrial um sector in the geographical north and in the south there was plantation slavery so this the plantations were interesting and different than other slave plantations because they were in some sense market dependent and they were producing for um you know capitalist demand in the united kingdom or in england at the time but um this when slavery ended right it was a very intensive form of agriculture um you weren't able to transition right away to a capitalist economy like the 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 american south was underdeveloped and so they they were able to successfully force black americans back onto the plantations in a different um la labor regime it wasn't slavery but it was a, a different labor regime it was called sharecropping like a kind of tenant farming and over time as industrialization transpired the kind of relative um low labor productivity in the South made it very, very hostile to unionization because labor was very, very intensive. So they used incredible repression and violence against um, working people in the South and any interracial kind of organizing. And so it created a situation in which a lot of Northern industries um, were able to unionize and the South wasn't. And then importantly, the South became a geographical region in which um, industry could start to move production um, away from the North to get away from union labor. And they could use it as a, a challenge to um, working people in the North who were trying to form unions. So before there was any offshoring to, to East Asia, you know, in the late 20th century, there was and is a redistribution of um, production facilities and plants in the American South and sometimes in Mexico that really prevented um, the development of a strong um, national labor movement. And then the other reason is the, the federal structure. So part of what, why this was so difficult is because every state has its own government and they were just able to, um, the, the, the labor movement was never strong enough to kind of have um, federally mandated like national level uh, bargaining agreements of any kind. So the kind of thing that you see, for example, in Sweden, in which a whole 
geographic, like a whole country uh, will, in a certain industry, like the whole country will, will bargain with capital together. Um, that just is totally unheard of and it just doesn't happen. So labor is just historically very, very weak. Okay, um, somebody is asking whether you can give us the um, citation for your for your article. Um, and um, yeah, they're also asking uh, whether you have numbers to underline your statements. I don't really know what they mean by that. Um, no, because it's written for philosophers and we just don't really do empirical research, which um, probably sounds crazy to you all, but that's um, the case. Um, but I, I do, if you take a look at the article, I do have say the citations of the economists that I, I, do, I do cite. So um, it's meant to be more of a, a theoretical paper. Okay, we have one text wall question. I got to read that before I can, can ask it. So I don't know, can, can you see the Q&A tool? Um, I can see the chat. Is there a, oh, oh, sorry. I was looking in the chat. I didn't see the Q&A tool. Um, Okay, so the question is whether or not this is too narrow and that just having more causal variables in play or more factors contributing to someone's situation or social status um, wouldn't be better. Um, I think that like, that's an empirical question whether or not a broader view is helpful. If it's the case that we take a look at the economy and the way that people navigate it. And we can see that certain kinds of conflicts emerge within it. And then there are factors that this just doesn't explain, then no problem. Like I, and I assume that like you would use the right sort of counterfactuals to try to figure out what the other important variables would, would be. Um, my problem though, is that the question that you're asking is putting, um, it's begging the question. So you don't know if the narrow, if it's really can't explain, you don't know how much it can explain if you don't have a good concept of class or economic or, um, and class domination to begin with. So my paper is just not, about having like a total theory of domination. It's asking very specifically, what is it that class contributes to either creating or reproducing these various oppressions? And it doesn't claim that they're, it's the only reason they are reproduced, but it is saying that it may be a, um, a very strong reason. And it helps, I would think, to say, okay, if it's the case that the class structure reproduces racism and sexism, then like, what's the scope of that claim? Okay, and then you can ask, all right, so it, it produces it in this way, it has race and gender have um, capitalist features in this society, and the class structure partly ex explains the forms that they take. If there is more, then you could say, okay, here's the limit of that claim, and here's how, um, in a particular instance, something else might reinforce it, like might create a different result here or there. Um, but you're not going to be able to make that kind of comparison or do that in kind of empirical research, or even have a robust theoretical view if your immediate concern is the concept of class is too narrow and then we need to move on from it aside instead of actually put it into motion in any analysis. And my criticism of my interlocutors is that is what they do. So they basically start with where your question starts and then they don't um, have anything else to say about the class structure. And I think that's a problem. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, unless anybody has any more questions, um, I think we are we're done basically. Um, uh, Lillian, if you could uh, stick around for for a few minutes after we are um, we let everybody go, that sure. would be great. Um, we're bleeding people already, so I don't think there's there's any uh, burning interest in in asking any more questions. Um, I see one more question. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure, like the the criticism that so the criticism or the question is how do you respond to the most frequent criticisms of the Marxist model of class, like a small business owner barely getting by by being part of the capitalist class versus a CEO being a wage worker, etc. Um, these so to first answer the question about the CEO. Um, this is a kind of principal agent problem that like used to be more important. And I think it's just not now like CEOs are paid directly out of profits. Like they get paid from dividends and so on. So they're not waged workers. Um, their interests are so deeply tied to their employer that like, there's not, I don't see a strong reason to think that they are distinct or meaningfully considered workers. Second of all, with small business owners, um, you know, every small business owner would like to be a capitalist and most of them don't work out. So their practice is fundamentally fitting into a macro dynamic economic situation that is governed by um, regulating capitals, the people who set the standards for industries, and they have to re react to those conditions. So they're not the prime movers of the economic system. And the reason that Marxists think capital and labor is important is because this is, or primary, is that it's the dynamic that sets the conditions for people like small business owners. So, you know, my dad owns a motel in Florida. He has to make sure that he's competitive relative to the Marriott down the street. So, um, and if that Marriott starts encroaching on his customers and his territory, then he'll just go out of business. That's the end of that story. Okay, yeah, I, I think that that's it. So um, we're probably gonna let all the um, viewers go. And then, uh, yeah, if you if you have like five or 10 minutes for, for a quick discussion, um, that would be would be great. Sure. Okay, thanks, everyone. Um, if you have questions, you can email me and it was nice to see you.